for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Blessed, prosperous, redeemed, forgiven, talented, creative, dis secure, disciplined, focused, prepared, qualified, motivated, valuable, free, determined, equipped, empowered, anointed, accepted, and approved. Not average, not mediocre. I am a child of the most high. What's wrong with you people? Because God broke the law for love. Heresy. Destroy it. You are not accountable to the Ten Commandments. You're not accountable to the Jewish law. We're done with that. God has done something new. Besides... Yeah, no. Um... Are you stupid or something? There's a reason we're losing this culture war. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speak. Them. So that's our very first question. What What is the doctrine of Christ? The doctrine of Christ is that which Jesus taught. It's the red letters. But shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. What's going on, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Course Correction Radio. That's right, Course Correction Radio. Welcome back to a, another edition of CCR Weekly. It's been a while since we've done one of these, but um, I uh, figured, you know, it's been a while since we posted over here, so we're going to do an episode here. We're kind of going to be talking about topics that we would normally be talking about on 33.3 News, um, but we're going to be leaning towards, you know, there we can talk about news, uh, and, you know, we give it from a Christian perspective. Today, we're mostly going to be talking about news that pertains to Christianity, and that's kind of always been the difference, right? Is one was, you know, we would focus on secular news. We wanted to see that from the perspective of the Bible. But this week we're going to be looking at, um, you know, a lot of news that affects Christianity. So before we get into our main story, just want to let you guys know that um, you can always look. This show is brought to you by, as always, by ShakenWakeRadio.com. You can check them out on the Shake and Wake, on their Shake and Wake Radio network at ShakenWakeRadio.com. You'll get shows. Uh, you know, you'll get us Monday nights after the Jim Duke perspective, but you can always get, you know, other shows, the, you know, shows you guys, uh, our regular listeners love the midnight ride, the, the cutting edge truth radio show, uh, breaking Babylon, all the things that you guys, you know, you love that, that, you know, if you, if you've listened to us on YouTube, you know, these are, these are shows that you'll find in our recommended, uh, on the recommended page on our YouTube channel. So make sure you guys check that out. Go show Annie some love. Shakenwakeradio.com. You know, later we will we'll have an ad for it. So that way, you know, because there's other shows you can get there as well. Don't take my word for it, though. Go check it out for yourselves. So our first story comes from the Roy's Report. This is julieroys.com. And it says, Supreme Court denies Christian colleges challenge to Biden administration's trans policy. Right? This story looks like it's by Jessica uh, Eteralde. I hope that's how you say that name. Uh, this says, this, The Supreme Court this week declined to hear an appeal from a Missouri Christian college 
seeking to halt a Biden administration policy the college believes may force it to allow biological males in women's dormitories. Last February, the College of the Ozarks near Branson, Missouri, asked the U.S. Supreme Court to block a U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, or a HUD, directive. The directive stated HUD would enforce the 1968 Fair Housing Act's prohibition on sex discrimination as a ban on discrimination because of gender identity. College of the Ozarks has previously lost several times in the lower courts after filing a lawsuit against HUD and the Biden administration in 2021. The uh, the lawsuit responded to President Joe Biden's January 2021 executive order interpreting the Fair Housing Act to prohibit discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. In February of 2021, HUD issued a memorandum instructing the Office of Fair Housing and Equal Opportunity, or the FHEO, to administer, this is a quote, quote, to, quote, administer and force, fully enforce, end quote, the Fair Housing Act consistent with the Biden administration's interpretation. Which is really interesting because until they rule on it, you know, an executive order is just that. An executive order, at least the way that our government is supposed to work, is the executive branch does not interpret the law. That is up to the judicial branch. But if the judicial branch has done this, yeah, that kind of sucks. Um, because now they have interpreted and they've given a statement, which all it is is an opinion. The only time a law can actually be ratified legally in the U.S. is through the Senate and the House, is through the congressional branch of government. Because, you know, if, if any of you guys remember U.S. government, you know our government is structured with a checks and balances power. We have three branches of government, and they all have checks and balances with each other to make sure that no one branch gets any uh, you know, any more power than they need. Unfortunately, the way it works in actuality is not the way it's supposed to work when you look at it on paper, and this is evidence of that in my opinion. Um, but it says, College of the Ozarks claimed that the guidance conflicted with its policy of assigning housing for students based on sex assigned at birth. The college believes the HUD directive forces religious schools to violate their beliefs by opening their dormitories, including dorm rooms and shared shower spaces, to members of the opposite sex, an announcement on its Facebook page read. The Alliance Defending Freedom, or the ADF, a conservative Christian legal nonprofit, represented the college. Its attorneys argued that the argued the HUD directive could compel the college to violate biblical principles and traditional Christian beliefs about sex and marriage. Now, here's something interesting that I'd like to know. Is whether or not this college and... I'm going to look this up real quick, so give me just a second. Okay, yeah, this was what I was worried about, and this was why I, I would looked it up, you know. When you see something like this, and um, typically what that means is, now, gr keep in mind, I am not a financial expert of any means. I am not a legal expert of any means, but I do understand that if you accept money from the federal government... You know, if you don't do what they want, they can pull your funding, right? So, now, as far as HUD and their jurisdiction, I don't have any of that. I was just curious to see if the uh, if the college, the university, or the College of the Ozarks, or whatever they're called. Now, apparently, there's a University of the Ozarks, but there's also a College of the Ozarks. So, that can get kind of confusing. Um... So, College of the Ozarks, which is, I believe, who we're talking about. Yes. College of the Ozarks does, they do, um, this is what their financial aid uh, section says in regards to that. You know, they have a work-study program that, you know, they can work in because, look, I do like it. They do... Um, they encourage, you know, they encourage their students not to go into debt. That's awesome. All right. Um, let 
anyway, I was trying to look because, you know, the first thing we need to look into with things like that, and, and, and it's the waters are muddy from what I can tell just by doing a quick search. But, like, look, here's the biggest thing is if you don't want the government, which it's it's getting harder to do things like this because the government is way overstepping their power. The Founding Fathers would have never dreamt of getting involved in things like this. This is just outrageous. But here's the biggest thing is, you know, under the Constitution, you are protected with freedom of religion, right? I remember when I was, you know, in school, we had to write papers on, you know, current events. There was this girl who had um, piercings. And some sort of school denied her something, and she went to the Supreme Court and was like, look, this is like, you know, this is part of my religion, yada, yada, I have freedom of religion. And, like, I don't think the ruling had even come out when I wrote this paper on it, but I basically wrote a paper arguing for why the Supreme Court should acknowledge that she should. Um, I mean, I gave reasons for, like... What we had to do was we had to write papers for both sides. So I gave, you know, a reasoning for both. But the fact of the matter is, is, you know, and I remember when I wrote my paper for why it shouldn't is because I actually wrote because the religion she argued for wasn't a recognized religion and it wasn't a 501c3 nonprofit. Now, of course, I've, I've changed my tune since then, you know, researching 501c3s and things like that. Um, but here's the fact of the matter is is really getting into the religion area in any aspect is dangerous territory because what that does is it sets the precedent for governments, which, by the way, the Bible said, what did Jesus say? He said, they hated me, so they will hate you more, right? So those are dangerous precedents that can cause, basically, in my opinion, it can give Satan a foothold into the door, which, of course, we knew this was going to happen with things like this, but... I don't know. What do you guys think? Do you think that... What are your thoughts on the Supreme Court... Um, you know, shooting down the school and basically not standing... What it looks like, it appears to look like, that they're not standing up for the school's religious freedom. Now, of course, I don't have all the details, right? So, you know, I don't know if, you know, if there's government funding that, you know, because, look, here's the thing. If you do any type of government funding or 501c3 nonprofits or anything like that, uh, you're giving the government a foothold into your sanctum, so to speak. And then you kind of become state-owned. And that that's when it can get really dangerous, in my opinion, because, you know... You're accepting, you're basically, you know, you lie down with dogs, you get fleas, right? Um, just going off of this, I don't know. I don't have an opinion on it. But I do want to know your opinion. You know, perspective is the key to understanding, right? So let me go and let me know. What do you guys think? Um, what do you guys think about that? So... This was an article, this was another article that we had from the Roy's Report, and I just thought this one was funny. Uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of, you know, kind of dark dark subject matter. So I wanted to throw in one for, you know, give a little bit of levity. This article from the Roy's Report says, For church worship teens, auto-tune covers a multitude of sins, especially online. According to the prophet Isaiah, grass withers, flowers fade, but God's word endures. In the age of social media, so do the mistakes of church musicians. Playing the wrong chord, forgetting the words to a song, or singing an off note. And a worship leader or singer may find themselves featured in Facebook videos or Instagram accounts like Worship Fails for years. Which is funny. If you guys haven't looked at some of the Worship Fails out there, they are absolutely hilarious. Um, so funny. As a result... Mark Jolicure, I hope that's how you say that, worship and creative pastor of Mockton Wesleyan Church in Mockton, New Brunswick, Canada, 
Churches like his have paid more attention to how their music sounds online. This includes using auto-tune or pitch-correcting software. Widely used in the recording industry to smooth out the rough edges of a voc- of vocalist, pitch correction has become fairly common in congregations. The pitch correction process feeds the sound sung into a microphone into a processor that aligns the singer's pitch with pure versions of the notes, yada, yada. Boring. Nobody cares how auto-tune works, right? In worship context, pitch correction makes it easier for less talented or less rehearsed singers to still help lead congregational singing, said to uh, said Jolicure. If they make small mistakes, they can be corrected easily. Churches are also more aware of hitting the right notes because... Uh, because their services are going out on live streams. People attending a service in person, said Jolik here, often have a better experience. The congregation singing resounds in the actual church building. Those at home only hear what's going on, are going into the microphone and coming out of their computer speakers. So check this out. This part's interesting. A 2023 study of online worship from Pew Research found that while remote worshipers rate online sermons and uh, online sermons and sermons they hear in person about the same they drop off when it comes to music 69% of those surveyed said they were extremely satisfied or very satisfied with music at and in person services that dropped to 54% of those who attended online of course cuz if you're at home unless you're just into it you know which I'm not going to belittle people, but a lot of people, um, you know, people get into worship at remote, especially, you know, when you're not in a mainstream church and you have nobody to worship with. You get more into the remote thing from there. But if you're like, you know, just living in fear and you don't want to get some sort of virus or things like that, odds are you're not getting into the service that much anyway, right? Because you know what they say, a... Uh, God didn't give us a spirit of fear, right? So if you're already starting your worship off in fear, and keep in mind I'm talking about those who are. I'm not blanketing here. You know, they're not probably not singing along. Because why would they, right? Anyway. Drew Small, a former megachurch audio engineer who now works in marketing, compared it to spell check for singers or the kind of bumpers used to help kids learn how to bowl. Quote, you still need to try and throw a strike, he said, but the bumpers help you from going into the gutter. COVID-19 also promoted the use of auto-tune because many church musicians found themselves suddenly in charge of producing services to be streamed online. That meant getting up to speed with the latest technology, such as pitch tuning, which has become increasingly affordable for churches. Now, honestly, we could go on with this article, but look, here's the thing. As somebody who used to lead worship in one of these modern, seeker-friendly churches, look, I just have to ask, what are your guys' thoughts on using pitch correction and auto-tune and things like that? You know, look... I want to read you, and normally, look, I, I, I know I'm a weirdo because I'm like old school, and you know, you grow up in church, and Leviticus is like one of them books, it's like, oh gosh, they're reading out of Leviticus, I'm so bored, right? <sighs> Excuse me. Um, I want to read this. Look, Leviticus is all about offerings made to God. And if you know anything about worship, you know, you think of offerings. You know, we think of animal sacrifices. We think of, you know, blood and brutality and things like that. And, you know, I could understand, you know, why, especially if you haven't grown up on farms and things like that, you know, 
there there is a grizzled nature to it. There is a harsh, morbid reality to taking a life, right? But that's the thing is what people don't people need to understand that when it comes to being in the presence of God. Sin, the penalty for sin is death. To be in the presence of God, that penalty needs to be paid, right? And what these offerings were was they were a foreshadowing of the fact that it would be through the blood of Christ that final atonement would be made, and that would give us a way to commune with the Father, right? But there's other things. There's so many other more important principles that can be learned from the book of Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 1, verse 3, talking about an offering of the herd. If his offering be a burnt offering of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering and shall make, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. He shall kill the bullocks before the Lord and the priest Aaron's son shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood round about on the altar that the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into into his pieces and the sons of Aaron the priest shall put fire upon the altar and lay the wood in order upon the fire and the priest and Aaron's sons shall lay parts shall lay the parts the head and the fat in order upon the wood that is on the fire which is upon the altar but his inwards and his legs shall be washed in water, and the priest shall burn all on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice, and an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord. Now, I can't remember exactly where the verse was, but I believe it was in Philippians when Paul was talking about their giving, their generous giving. He said this was like a sweet savor to the Lord, right? And that's the thing. There's one of the principles you've got to learn about worshiping God is it has to be willing worship. You have to give of the overflow of your heart, right? But notice what else it says here. It should be a male without blemish. It has to be the very best. And one could argue that putting the pitch correction on, well, I'm giving my best to the Lord, man. I just want to make sure it's perfect. But I think that misses the point. Because notice what it said. It said an under-rehearsed. It was perfect for an under-rehearsed musician, which means it's, it, it could potentially give people an easy way out. They don't have to do it as hard because they have something to fall back on now. It's a crutch. People are more worried about how it sounds to the listeners than they are about the fact that they're making an offering of worship before the Most High. I think this is a huge problem. I really do. This is, I don't know. I don't know how to, it's just, to me, in my opinion, this is unacceptable. Could you imagine, do you think David, when he got up there and he wrote these beautiful psalms, or Asaph, who was the chief musician, by the way, I sure, I am sure Asaph did everything he could to make sure that that music was the best it could possibly be. But I guarantee you they took it seriously and they were worried about what God, the Most High, thought of their music. Not the people around them. Go and read the Psalms. They are directed directly towards the Father. I don't know. This this makes me very, very angry. But let me know what you guys think. Am I overreacting here? Let me know what you guys think in the comments, whether it's on Spreaker. If you listen to us through the Spreaker app, you're able to leave a comment. When I upload it to Spotify, I'll try to make sure that there's a question that you can answer. Um, but... I don't know. I'd love to know what you guys think. So, our next story, and we're going to switch topics here. We're coming up on about 30 minutes, so let's take a quick break, and we will go.
we'll go from there. So. You guys are listening to CCR Weekly right here on Course Correction Radio. We're going to take a quick break. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back to discuss our next story, Transgender Teens, Pronouns, and Preferred Names. Youth pastors grapple with new questions. So if you're like me, you're traveling a lot. Hey, Trey here with Course Correction Radio. And my question to you is, if you're traveling a lot, why are you not listening to the Shake and Wake Radio Network on shakeandwakeradio.com? On Shake and Wake Radio, you will find great shows such as Through the Black with Thomas Dunn, The Midnight Ride with John Pounders and David Carrico, The Cutting Edge, Truth Radio Show, and so much more. You can even catch yours truly on Monday nights after the Jim Duke perspective right there on shakeandwakeradio.com just a friendly reminder ccr weekly is a variety show where we will talk about the news that is currently going on as well as topics in the bible that people really want to know about if you are here just for the bible topic i completely understand However, I do ask that you be patient with us as we get through the news because we are watchmen on the wall and Jesus commanded us to watch and that is what we want to help you do as well. So we will get to the biblical topic, but we are going to save that for last as it is the most crucial and important topic that we have. Thank you so much for all your support and your patience and we look forward to hearing from you in our live chat. God bless you all, and we'll talk to you real soon. Welcome back to CCR Weekly. Uh, My name is Trey Harris. Thank you guys for sticking with me thus far. Um, man, this next one's interesting. So it, this is from Christianity Today. Transgender teens, pronouns, and preferred names. Youth pastors grapple with new questions. With transgender identity continuing to rise in the U.S., evangelical pastors are challenged to think through how they might welcome a trans person attending their church. For many conservative pastors, this scenario may still be a hypothetical. But odds are for the youth in their congregation, the question of how to relate to their transgender peers is already a reality. Nearly 20% of those who identify as transgender in the United States are between the ages of 13 and 17, according to this hyperlink. Let's see what this is. This is a report from the Williams Institute. Trying to make sure that we leave that linked if you guys want to check that out. No, it says uh, so 20% of those who identify as transgender in the United States are between the ages of 13 and 17, which means that most teens today go to school alongside students who identify as trans. High school and college students have ushered in an influx of questions and scenarios that their church leaders and mentors hadn't faced growing up. They're considering their witness in contexts where some can see it as hateful or discriminatory to believe gender remains tied to biological sex. Northview Northview Church in Carmel, Indiana holds a biblically orthodox view on gender and sexuality, and high school pastor Jude Wright knows how sensitive the topic can be. He encourages students to lead with relationships with their friends and classmates, citing the example of Jesus meeting people where they were. Quote, there's a generation where 
they just tried to pound truth and pound Bible without having relationship, said Wright. And that's just not the culture we live in nowadays. Among the youth, among the youth group of about 150 students, uh, of about 100, uh, 150, students regularly ask questions about sexuality and gender. In response, Wright first points to love and compassion in God's character, emphasizing his goodness in the midst of identity struggles and confusion. They're asking if God is good, can you prove it to me? How can I experience that for myself? Wright said. He believes churches can reflect that goodness as they respond to those with uh, they, to these questions with empathy, love, and sensitivity. I think that's very important, too. You know, empathy, you know, that is, you know, crucial. And I think we could all do a better job of that because, you know, we all see grooming and things like that. And it's just easy to get, you know, that righteous indignation and that righteous anger. But it can go so much further if we don't keep it abated. I want to go to when we just read this and... This was on the last episode that we aired, I believe, and it may have been the one before that. But 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And this is what it says. I gotta find it. So starting in verse 9, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. So effeminate and arsenicoite, those are two different words, right? Abusers of themselves with mankind is the word for homosexuality. It is a blanket statement of man betters, right? nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. A lot of people like to stop there, especially these are the verses that people use, you know, when they want to talk about the Bible and condemn it as a book of judgment and condemnation and things like that. I've heard, not many, but I have heard people use that. But for some reason, they never go to the next verse. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus by the Spirit of our God. And, you know, when we talk about empathy and things like that, you know, we can talk about um, transgenderism or whatever, you know. Some people prefer to call it transvestites, things like that, Um you can call it what you want, but the fact of the matter is the Bible does address it in the book of Deuteronomy. It says, A man shall not wear that which pertaineth to a woman, and a woman shall not wear that which pertaineth to a man, right? Then we have here, it talks about this word effeminate, nor effeminate. So let's just, let's do a quick word study on that and see what that means, right? Um. We're not going to spend too much time on this particular story because I do have more stuff that I want to get into. Um, All right, so... All right, and what I've got here is we have the interlinear pulled up for 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. All right, so let's take a look at this. Now, I love this because what you can do is, you can come over here. So this word effeminate is the Greek word malakoi. So we can come up here. This is Strong's Greek word 3120. I want to pull this up because we can look at several, and I love Bible Hub because it gives you several different places where you can look this up, right? Soft. Effeminate is what Strong's Concordance says. Of persons, soft, delicate, effeminate. The in a, the New American Standard Exhaustive Concordance, effeminate or soft. It's a primitive word, but I want to look at this word. 
So like I said, the word is malakos. I want to look at it in Thayer's. So, because it means soft or soft to the touch is the literal definition of the word. It can mean in Homer, in the Odyssey, and in the Iliad, he uses it as more of a soft raiment. Um, it can metaphorically, and in a bad sense, it says, mean effeminate or of a catamite, a male who submits his body to a natural lewdness. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 is what it gives for that. Um, and apparently... It was used in, you know, a few other places like that as well. So, you know, it's different than our Senecoites, but it kind of goes along with it. Um, and in my opinion, if you were to ask me, I would say that this definitely goes to the man. You know, this, you know, either a, you know, a man that acts womanly, but a definitely a man who is, you know, dressing as a woman or thinks that they're a woman or whatever, this would apply. And this would definitely go to this conversation. And how would you do it? Number one is understanding. There has to be empathy. There has to be patience and compassion in a situation like this, right? This person, number one, needs to know that there is hope that can be found, right? They, they do need to know they're a sinner, of course, right? Colossians chapter 2. If I can get over there. I believe it's Colossians chapter 2. So, yeah. It's Colossians chapter 2, verse 13. And you being dead in your sins and uncircumcision of your flesh, he hath quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. This is the part I want to focus on, though. Being dead in your sins. And the uncircumcision of your flesh, right? That's important. It's important to, for people to know that because what is the one thing that a lot of people talk about when they talk about how could a loving God condemn people to hell? And that's kind of a question that misses the point. Because of the doctrine of original sin, and the Romans, the book of Romans talks about how through one man sin entered the world and through sin death Right? And that death goes to all mankind. So what you have to understand is because of your fallen nature, you're already on a path to hell by default. You could be the best person in the world morally, but you're already on a path to hell because the standard is that high. But God is so loving, you know, John three 16, we've all heard it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever should believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent his world, son into the world not to condemn the world, but that through him the world might be saved. John three sixteen and 17. See, and that word, you know, when you look at it, God loved the world for God so loved the world. Like this means that the love of God was so intense he had such a love inside him that he gave up his one son. He did exactly what he asked Abraham to do, right? God asked Abraham to give up an offering, to give Isaac as an offering before him. Why? Because he was trying to show how far his love was willing to go. See, God did exactly what he asked Abraham. He gave up his son as an offering. And because of the divine blood of Jesus, sins can be washed away. Your heart can be regenerated. And look, God is loving enough to where you don't have to take this gift. 
but he offers it to everyone. You have every right to live in your sin and live the lifestyle you want. But what you have to also understand is, is that every action has a consequence. And you're already on a pathway toward hell. Do you want to keep on it? Or do you want to have life more abundant? Because that life more abundant can be found in Christ. The question is, is are you willing to repent of your sins? Because even though it feels good right now, there comes a time where that just can't satisfy the way it used to. And you got to have more. Right? And the only way you break that cycle and that bondage of always needing more is by repenting of that sin, turning away from it, and finding fulfillment in Christ. And believe me, nobody knows this better than I do. Trust me. I've been there. Maybe not with the same exact particular sin as, you know, some people with like transgenderism or homosexuality or things like that. But I do know what it's like to feel in bondage to sin to the point where something's got to give. And it can be given straight to Christ. All he asks is that that we do give it to him, right? And then that we take his yoke upon us. And he says his yoke is easy and his burden is light. That's the words of Christ. Come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, is what he says. Rest. And he does say to learn from him and take his yoke upon you, for his yoke is easy and his burden is light. All we have to do is give up things that are already bad for us and are killing us anyway. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. And that word wages is it's like the wages you would get for working at the end of the day. The wages that you are receiving for your work, your life, the things you are putting your energy into, the wages of that is death. But we can give that up and we can turn from it and we get a free gift of eternal life. Through Christ Jesus our Lord, his finished work on the cross, and by following and submitting to his doctrine. Which is for our good, by the way. Think about it. I want you to think about this. And if you're a mouthiest and you're listening to this, then, you know, this isn't going to change your mind, and that's fine. It's not my place to change your mind. My job is just to tell you. You know, the Bible is so good that it provides ways for the widows and the orphans. But you would leave the corners of the fields that they could glean. And it solved a hunger problem, right? Made it less work for the farmers, too. Everybody wins in that scenario. A sheep got stolen? Well, you had to give that sheep plus more in restitution because it created a justice problem. There was injustice. You stole from somebody. Now you've got to pay it back and give more. That's restitution. There were certain commands in the Bible that the only way to make it right was death. Rape, murder, adultery. But And, you know, we all know adultery is the ultimate form of betrayal. You make a promise to somebody to have and to hold, and you break that, you can break any promise, right? That's a person that can't be trusted. And sadly, it's a sin that can be easily fallen into, especially in today's world, right? That's why, notice what it says first. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers. Notice those are mentioned before effeminate or homosexual, abusers of themselves with mankind, right? Right? Because it's a slope that you can go down. They're all sexual sins. But anybody who can do the first two is subject to the rest of them anyway. Fornicating is a big one. That's the word porneo, right? Pornography, you're under that. Adultery. Idolatry is just spiritual fornication. You've betrayed the God you worship. Some of you guys need to look into idolatry because I'm telling you, idolatry runs rampant in the churches, Protestant and Catholic alike. 
And orthodox, of course. Adulterers. There's a sacred bond between a man and a woman and God. It's a three-way covenant. And unfortunately, that gets broken a lot. The point that I'm trying to get to is such were some of you. Anybody can be rescued from this. What does it say? But ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. And look, it takes faith for you to believe that. You have to believe that you are justified. You know, our kids, our lesson coming up this Sabbath day is going to be without faith. It is impossible to please God. You have to believe that you are sanctified and washed of this. That's faith. And believe it, you know what Jesus says in John chapter 10, I am the door. Well, all doors have hinges, right? Typically here in America, I don't know. I've never really been outside, you know, much, but you know, a, a door, I'm looking at one right now. It's got three hinges. Well, I believe that door that Jesus is the, you know, that door of salvation, that Jesus is that door is hinged on three things, faith, hope, and charity. As first Corinthians 13 says. Faith is a big one because without it, it's impossible to please God. You have to believe. The Bible says that you are sanctified. You are washed. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now you have to believe that, that God makes good on his promises. God can speak the world into existence. How much easier would it be for him to wipe away all of our transgressions in the name of Jesus? Really think about that. That's, that's a thought that I think we all need to meditate on. And I highly encourage you, if you get time, you need to read Spurgeon's sermon on Hebrews 11.6. Without faith, is it, impossible? it is impossible to please God. It's a real thinker. I think that the compassion... And the empathy is going to be so important because a lot, unfortunately, for whatever reason, a lot of these people already have qualms with Christianity. And so compassion and understanding, but not at the expense of sound doctrine. And that doctrine, of course, is the fact that you're on a pathway to hell by default. But you can be cleansed from it. And there is something that God expects from you in the meantime. So... I, uh, that's about all I have for today. You know, I had more that we were going to talk about. Um, there's something I want to get into eventually with mega churches, And, you know, it's a, it's a little presentation I'm working on. I guess really it's actually more of a message called The Sorcerers of Greed. And how greed plays a part in the end time sorcery of the false prophet and the end times religion. But I might make that our first topic for the new show coming up soon, Earl Grey with Trey, which is going to be a Sunday morning audio podcast that, uh, at least for the time being, you'll be able to find exclusively on our Substack page. It'll be free for everybody to listen to, but it will be there for you. And then we'll be thinking about doing bonus content with that one, which will, of course, be free for everybody. Um, we do ask that if you do feel led to get a subscription, because it does help out, um, with the cost of broadcasting. Um, but of course, you know, we want to make that because we'll still be giving edifying content where we'll do sermon reviews and discernment type ministry um, with that. So thank you guys so much for your time. Like I said, make sure you check out shakenwakeradio.com. You'll find us there on Monday nights after the Jim Duke Perspective. Um, so make sure you guys go show some love there. Shake and Wake Radio. Dot com. We'll talk to you soon.